Welcome back to NUICfootball.com. I am your host, Kyle Kampmeyer. Week 8 didn't provide many surprises, but there were a few worthy games to take note of. First one was Fulton traveling down to Knoxville, who was ranked number 5 in Class 2A. Fulton entered that game as a three-point favorite and came out with a running clock win 42 to nothing to improve to 5-3. and three. This allows Fulton the almost sure opportunity of a sixth win to be 6-3 six and three entering the playoffs. Dupec survived some critical turnovers to turn away Forrest in 6 to nothing in Durand and give the Cardinals their first loss of the year. Stockton had to battle back from a 6 nothing halftime deficit to beat Dakota and keep their playoff hopes alive. River Ridge was the favorite in their game with West Prairie, but came up on the wrong side of a 26-20 loss. They need to win this week to guarantee a spot in the playoffs. Heading into Week 9, there are a couple games to watch. Lena Winslow and Forreston visit their rivalry this week with the conference title on the line. A Forest and one will give us a three-way tie for the title between Lena Winslow, Forested, and Dupac, where a Lena Winslow win wins it outright for the Panthers. Dupac has the challenge of playing Altoff Catholic, who many South pundits feel could compete for a 3A state title, with two transfers receiving Division I offers and a third player also receiving Division I offers. This will be our final barometer between Altoff and Lena Winslow, as Lena Winslow beat Dupac 48-27 just a few weeks ago. Stockton and Galena match up in the oldest rivalry in the NUIC. These two teams have been playing each other since 1919, and a Stockton win puts the Blackhawks back in the playoffs for the first time since 2018. We're going to cover these games and take a look at the playoff outlook next. This NUICfootball.com production is powered by Lemons Ambulance Service in Lena, Illinois. We always plan for the expected, but sometimes we need to plan for the unexpected. Lemons has been serving Stevenson and Joe Davies counties since 1869. Call someone you can trust in your time of need. Call Lemons Ambulance Service. Rose Bowman and the Choice Realty team understand that buying or selling real estate is among the most important financial transactions of your life. They are dedicated to providing personal and thorough service with a sharp focus on their clients' needs. Their licensed staff looks forward to assisting you in any of the following areas. Residential, condominiums, new construction, land, farms, commercial, investment, or leasing. Choice Realty is locally owned and operated with offices in Freeport, Galena, and the Galena Territories. So when it's time to buy or sell, give Rose Bowman a call at 630-697-2480. River Ridge travels to Alden Hebron in hopes of getting that fifth win to make sure they hit the playoffs. They enter this game with a 4-4 four four record while Alden Hebron enters at 3-5. Last year, River Ridge won this game 50-44 in Week 6. Last week, River Ridge lost 26-20 to West Prairie, and Alden Hebron won 27-26 over Peoria Heights. River Ridge will enter this game as three touchdown favorites as they are favored by 20 points. However, you can't just go off of ratings and what probabilities are and things like that. You still have to be able to show up and play the game. River Ridge has been able to set themselves up in a very good situation. And until last week's loss, their only three losses on the year came to the top three teams in the North 2 division. Last week, they were the favorites over West Prairie, and they came up short by six points. That cost them that game. This is why this is a very important game. You can't go into this one looking it over. But there are some things that help favor River Ridge in this game. There are a couple common opponents. Alden Hebron has already played Orangeville, who River Ridge beat. Orangeville beat Alden Hebron by a score of 53-36. to They've also played AFC. They lost to AFC 34-33. to River Ridge pounded AFC 54-8 to uh, back in uh, week 6. Orangeville also pounded AFC 46-12 to back in week 1. So there's a good argument that says that River Ridge should win this game handily. And provided that they take care of business the way that they should, this game should go by way of the Wildcats in a hurry. They just need Damon Dittmar 
Seth Nicholas and Ben Richmond to show up and play the games that they've been putting down on stats all season long and get the rest of the team to play up to another level. And if they do that, River Ridge will find themselves back in the playoffs for the first time since 2019. So my pick is River Ridge. Bushnell Prairie City hits the road to play Milledgeville, where the host missiles enter with a 7-1 record. BPC comes in with a 4-4 four four record. These two teams did not play last year, and last week Milledgeville won handily 36-16 over Unity Christian, at one time being up 36 to nothing before putting the subs in, while BPC lost to Ridgewood 36-14, in a game that was actually closer than what the final score would indicate. Milledgeville enters this game favored by five touchdowns, which equates out to 34 points for this one. The probabilities of Milledgeville winning this game are at 99%, very high. BPC has been in our playoff outlook for um, a couple weeks now since they took that one loss uh, to West Central that they weren't expected to take. And since that time, they have been projected to hit the 4-5 and five mark and be the 16 seed in the playoffs. Now there are a couple different scenarios that could take place that could keep BPC out. Um, but with that said, Milledgeville just needs to win. Provided that they can do that, they will definitely sew up that number three seed regardless of uh, other things happening unless there's some major upsets. Upsets that would hurt them would be Martinsville over STM and then Polo beating Amboy. If those two scenarios happen, then Milledgeville would, would drop down in the seating, but only if that happens. The likelihood of that happening is relatively low, but anything can happen. Both those games are going to be big games across all of eight man this week as far as the top of the rankings are concerned. So we'll see how all of that uh, plays out. But back to this game here, you know, Milledgeville just needs to continue to plug away and do what we've seen them do all season and get prepared for the playoffs where they are expected to host come round one. Missiles will be ringing the bell in this one. Quest Charter Academy was supposed to come up to visit Orangeville. However, they have forfeited their season or, or this game for the second week in a row, which brings their final uh, season record to 0-9. Orangeville is currently looking for a team to play. However, if they do not find one, they will receive the forfeit win and move to 5-4, and four, which will automatically put them in the playoffs. Not that it wasn't going to happen anyhow, as they were favored to be 38-point winners in this game and had a 99% probability of winning this game. Either way, we hope Orangeville does find a game. That way they can celebrate senior night. But if they do... Hopefully they find one that can guarantee them a victory so they can get to the playoffs. Because right now, they are set up for a playoff spot the way it stands. Our eight-man game of the week is brought to you by Best Realty. Best Realty has been helping Northern Illinois tackle their real estate needs since 1990. Whether you're buying or selling in the market for residential, commercial, or acreage, they'll help you get the best deal. Call the Best Realty team at 815-248-3408 or visit them online at bestrealtyproperties.com. Our Best Realty 8-Man Game of the Week has us going to Amboy, where the Clippers are playing host to Polo. Polo enters with a 7-1 record, while Amboy is 8-0, where they are ranked number one, and they have been since the start of the season. Last year, Amboy won this game 28-12 in Week 1, 
Last week, Polo won by forfeit over Quest Charter Academy, while Amboy put up a 72-12 win over Orangeville. The Clippers will enter this game as a three-touchdown favorite by 21 points. What this game is going to bring is a lot of fireworks. There's going to be a large crowd in Amboy at the harbor on Friday night, including myself as I am looking forward to the voyage down to the harbor uh, to take in this great eight-man competition. These two teams have been going back and forth with each other for uh, the past two years, and it's been it's been great to see. Both teams have studs on this on both sides of the ball with Polo featuring uh, Brock Soto and Dilo Fernandez, and boy, of course, with Landon Welcho, Quinn Luffelman, Eddie Jones, and Brennan Blaine have really just taken Amboy to a whole nother level compared to the rest of the eight-man league. Time will tell if that will transition to an eight-man state title, but right now they got to focus on Polo, who enters this game ranked number four in state, Amboy holding on to that number one state ranking. I'm sorry, Polo is number three in state this week. I forgot they got pushed back up. Either way, this is going to be a big one for Clipper fans. And for the Marcos, they're going to be looking for ways to take opportunities to uh, limit the playmaking skills that Amboy puts into play. It's going to be hard for either team to stop their stars. However, I think that this game definitely favors Amboy uh, quite a bit, considering that Amboy did beat Milledgeville here just a couple weeks ago by two scores, and Milledgeville put Polo away pretty handily uh, back at, towards the beginning of the season. With that said, my pick in this game is Amboy, but I do expect this to be a big game. When you take a look at common opponents, the one game that really stands out the most is the game with Ridgewood. Both of them had similar victories over Ridgewood, although I would say that Polo got a little bit more of the luck of the draw in their game, where Amboy continued to have the lead throughout the course of the game. Um, had to come back a little bit. I believe if I remember that correctly. However, in either case, Amboy, to me, is the favorite in this game, and they are my pick to win. This portion of our broadcast is brought to you by Diedrich Epoxy Flooring. Serving Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, Diedrich Epoxy is the source for all of your epoxy needs. Give Diedrich Epoxy Flooring a call today at 815-239-1158 for your free estimate. EPC at Dakota is going to be a pride game as both teams have been eliminated from playoff uh, contention. EPC enters this game at 2-6 and six, while Dakota enters at 3-5. and five. Last year, EPC won this game 40-36 to 36 in Week 5. Last week, Dakota lost 14-6 to six to Stockton to eliminate their playoff chances while EPC beat West Carroll 44 to nothing. Dakota does enter this game favored by eight points. What will be interesting to see is how each of these teams play this game. Playoff points really isn't uh, uh, an issue in this game as neither team played outside competition. Uh, that is going to be in the playoff picture as well. Uh, EPC had played Aurora Central Catholic. Dakota had played Fisher and their non-conference opponents. Uh, so, no matter what, the playoff points won't matter for any of this. And all of the NUIC teams are going to get at least one playoff point from this game anyway, regardless of which direction it goes. So with that said, it's straight pride. Who wants it more? If you're Dakota, you want to be able to build off what you have. You have a pretty young team. You have a lot of players that are going to be returning next year. You had an opportunity to be a playoff contending team and came up just a little bit short. EPC, on the other hand, again, another very young team, has a lot to build upon, kind of took a back seat this year, uh, came in a little bit below expectations from what we had forecasted them to be. However, at the same token, 
you still have things that you can build on. You have a lot of sophomores playing for you uh, with Will Burchin and Draven Zier. Uh, and, and you got some very good things to build off there. Dakota, likewise, you know, they, they are relying on more senior leaders behind uh, Nolan Mayberry and Jason Bowers and Connor Matthews while playing a freshman at quarterback. So, you know, there, there are some things that were adjusted midway through the season to help get Dakota steered in the direction they wanted to go. Opportunities existed. Unfortunately, they just came up short for the Indians. EPC, same way, you know, right out of the gates. They lost to Galena in a game that many thought that they could win, should win. Um, they performed uh, exceptionally well in that game as far as statistical stats, putting up yards, but they just didn't win it on the scoreboard and end up losing that game by three touchdowns. A couple other games, you know, that they had as well kind of took them away from the opportunities that existed, and it led to many people feeling like EPC was one of the best 0-5 teams in the state early on. They had a, a, a close game with Forreston that Forreston eventually won by 14 points. They had a very close game with Fulton, and we already see where Fulton's going as they enter the playoffs. And back to that game in week one with Galena where the score didn't really show the true fight in that game as they were only down 14 to 6 at halftime before Galena scored two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. So a, a lot of things for both these clubs to build off of. Dakota's the pick to win, but don't be surprised if EPC gives the Indians a little bit of fits here. Fulton hits the road to play West Carroll, and they enter with a 5-3 record. West Carroll enters with an 0-8 record. Last year, Fulton won this game 63-0 in Week 2. Last week, Fulton went down to Knoxville, where they came out with a 42-0 win over the Class 2A number 5 state-ranked Blue Bullets, while West Carroll lost 44-0 to EPC, uh, pretty much keeping that scoreless streak alive in the NUIC minus the six points that they put up against Stockton here a couple weeks ago. Fulton is favored in this game by 54 points. There's really not much to talk about on this game as what it will do is provide Fulton the opportunity to improve to 6-3 and three and give them better playoff seeding, which is exactly what the steamers needed. So, with that said, Fulton just needs to take care of business, go in, be healthy, stay healthy, get your subs in, go home, and get ready for the playoff show. Watch us live. Stockton and Galena play each other in Galena, and when these two teams meet, you can throw records aside as this is a rivalry as old as Football has been to the area. These two teams have been going at it since 1919. Stockton enters this game with a 4-4 four and four record while Galena enters at 2-6. and six. Last year, Galena won 40-8 in Week 4. Last week, Stockton beat Dakota 14-6. And Galena lost to Lena Winslow 50 to nothing. The Blackhawks are favored in this game to win by 16 points. But like I said, you got to take this game with a grain of salt because this is a rivalry game and Galena is looking to play and knock Stockton out. Basically, if, if Stockton can win, they're in. However, if Galena wins, Stockton's out and it doesn't do anything but help Galena build for what they have coming back next year as well. With that said, though, that's always a tall task. Stockton has been looking very good with the running game of Carl Hub, Tanner Guile, and Mark Detweiler is really starting to take off. And they still have the passing game with Colby Tucker and Brady Haas and then a couple other guys in there as well. With that said, Michael Haas has definitely uh, picked up his gameplay, and you're starting to see Wesley Logeman as well as the line is beginning to improve. Now one of the drawbacks to Stockton from the two different games I've seen him play in is they tend to start slow, 
and then get going later on. They got to find a way to start fast. You got to start early and then stay on the stay on the gas. If you give Galena any opportunity for life and hope, they will take advantage of it, and we've seen that happen throughout the course of the season. Albeit, they really haven't done a whole lot as far as winning ball games since week two, but they're still a very good team. They had a close loss with uh, Saranac, Michigan the week prior to that, which was week three. They had a close game with Forreston before Forreston finally won that game by a good differential, and they had a close game with Fulton as well. So, as you can hear the things going on, you know, some close games with some good competition. Stockton, on the other hand, was drilled by Fulton. Uh, they did play close with Forreston, but Forreston got up early quick on them. And then they stopped and just couldn't recover as they basically played the last three quarters in a tied ball game, but the damage had already been done. Now, one of the benefits that Stockton does have over Galena is that they beat Dakota, where Dakota had just beat Galena 20 and nothing the week before. So there are things that both these teams need to build on and work on, but there is more riding on the line for Stockton, and Galena wants to take that and knock it off the shoulder. We'll see, we'll see if they can knock that block off, but... My pick to win in this game are the Blackhawks. They've been my team to watch since the beginning of the season. They were my dark horse team, and now they're here, ready for the opportunity to make the playoffs happen. So the Blackhawks win. One of the games that we've been looking forward to since the start of the season, and then even after we began the season and started hearing more about about this team is that game between Dupac and Altoff Catholic. This game will be played at Illinois Wesleyan University on Friday night. Both teams enter with 7-1 records. This is the first time these two teams have played each other. Last week, Dupac scraped out a 6-0 win over Forston, where Altoff Catholic beat Granite City 53-14. Now, what's all the talk about with Altoff Catholic? Well, let's talk about it. They feature three guys getting Power 5 Division 1 offers in running back De'Aire Hill Jr., defensive tackle Jason Dowell, and cornerback Charleston Colden. Everybody takes a look at what Belleville has done as far as their schedule. And yes, it's true. They have played bigger teams. But when I take a look at some of these teams that they've played, the only one that really stands out to me is St. Dominic out of O'Fallon, Missouri. That's the team that they lost to 34 to 19. They are 8-0. They are in they are an equivalent of a 4A team in the state of Illinois. But you take a look at a couple other teams that they've played. They've played Collinsville, who is 5-3 and three and will make the class 7A state playoffs. They've played Granite City, who's a 7A team that's 0-8. Um and then a couple other teams, Centralia is a 4A school that's 2-6 and six that they beat. Uh, they beat St. Teresa, which is one of the barometer games we were looking at between them and Lena Winslow. And now with Dupac playing uh, Belleville, Altoff Catholic, now we have our second barometer game to test how Altoff Catholic compares to Lena Winslow as the Crusaders are everybody's pick to make it to Bloomington out of the 1A South Brackets. Now, one of the things that we have noticed about Altoff Catholic is they are highly skilled offensively. They are very big up front. They average about 260, 270 pounds across the front line, but they do have some issues when it comes to playing physical teams. So, We'll see how that translates with Dupac. Dupac is a physical team, but if this game is any uh, lead up to what we could see in Lena Winslow, uh, you know, it could be a game that is probably the toughest, if not the second toughest game for Dupac all season. With that, 
Dupac needs to be fundamentally sound in this game. They need to remain disciplined. One of the things I've noticed about Altoff Catholic is that they will lose discipline in games. And those are the teams that can beat them. Uh, one of the games that they had was with Modern Day. They're actually behind. And Modern Day is a 2A school with a 6-2 and two record now. That Altoff Catholic was able to come back and pull out that win 41 to 22. If Dupac can get things going with Cooper Hoffman, get the run game going uh, and, and with uh, Connor Hughes and, and be able to consistently hit the passes that they need to hit and change up their looks and their keys, they, they should find some success. You can't go in this game looking at, oh my gosh, we have three Division One recruits on the other side of the ball. How many times have we seen that happen? It's not very often at a 1A level, but at the same token, it's not like Dupac hasn't faced 1A talent in recent years either. So it's not something that they are they haven't seen. With that, they have to be fast off the ball. We have to see Dupac have some explosive pushes off the ball, both offensively and defensively. That way they can neutralize all tough Catholic in any regard that they can get an advantage of. With that, Dupac does enter this game as 11-point favorites, and they have a projection to win by 20 points. Looking at some of the things that we have here, I do feel that Dupac is capable of winning this game, but I would have to say that Altoff Catholic probably is a little bit better um, in a couple facets of the game. The skills guys, you know, it's it's hard to compete with skills guys when you got a couple D1 skill guys. And, and, and then Jason Dahl at defensive tackle, been told by numerous people that he can take up half the field by himself. Um, and, and he looks every part of that Power 5 Division One specimen. I mean, he's he looks like uh, Superman out there compared to other guys, a man among boys, and we're talking like Hercules men. But either way, you know, dupac has got to stay sound fundamentally, don't get into the, uh, whatever uh, issues could prevail in this game. You know, stay disciplined in what you do and take advantage of that. Um, and if they do, this should be a great game. I'm really looking forward to hearing about this game. I wish I could make it down to see it. I thought it was going to be on Saturday, but I just looked at the schedule. It's on Friday, but it is what it is. Um, just very interested in this game. My pick to win is Altoff, but I would not be surprised if Dupec comes out as a winner in this one. Our 11-man game of the week is brought to you by Best Realty. Best Realty has been helping Northern Illinois tackle their real estate needs since 1990. Whether you're buying or selling, in the market for residential, commercial, or acreage, they'll help you get the best deal. Call the Best Realty team at 815-248-3408 or visit them online at bestrealtyproperties.com. Our Best Realty game of the week is the rivalry between Lena Winslow and Forreston. The Panthers come in perfect at 8-0 while Forreston enters this game at 7-1. Last year, these two teams got to meet up twice. In the regular season, Lena Winslow won 28-14 to in Week 9, and then they won again in the semifinals 38-16. to Last week, Lena Winslow beat uh, Galena 50 to nothing, and Forreston lost to Dupec 6 to nothing. This rivalry keeps getting better and better. However, Lena Winslow is 21-8 and eight against the Cardinals all-time, and when it comes to playing in Forreston, Lena Winslow dominates in this series where they own a 12-1 and one record against the Cardinals in Forreston. The Panthers will enter this game favored by 18 points. When you take a look at this game and break it down, you know, some of the things that we've seen out of Forreston all year are – what we've talked about most of the season, you know, you sit here and you say, well, Forreston left two touchdowns on the field in this game. They left a touchdown or two in this game, in this game, in this game. And it's a repeating thing. Like, it's almost like Forreston has yet to put together a complete game where they can play the way that 
everybody across the state thought that they would be. I mean, it's one of those things where I'm even talking to a guy from Gibson City who thinks that Gibson City, if they have two receivers, they win that game against Forreston all day long. And yet here we are talking about Forreston potentially leaving two touchdowns on the field in that game as well. As I was physically there to watch it, and I, in my opinion, they did turn the ball over twice on downs within the red zone when normally a typical good, disciplined Forreston football team punches those two in for scores, which would have given Forreston a three-touchdown lead at that time. And they were controlling the field position as up until that point, every time Forreston had the ball there on the Falcon side of the 50-yard line. So uh, either way, it doesn't matter. They still came out with that victory. Um, but it's one of those things that we continue to see. They had to fight back against Fulton to win. They had to fight back against Gibson City to win. They were able to get up early against Dakota and then hold on for that win. Uh, Galena, they had to fight in. EPC was putting it to them for a little bit, and they had to fight back in that game. Stockton gave up the two quick scores in the first quarter, and it pretty much was all forced that needed to win that game. But it was a slugfest the rest of the way as well. And then, of course, last week with Dupec, you know, people can argue one way or another. To me, it was a great game for Forreston as far as them showing up to play Dupec. But when you take a look, you know, Dupec had a touchdown that was overturned due to a penalty that they end up not scoring on. They had an interception in the back of the end zone. They had another interception within Forreston territory. So there's probably maybe three touchdowns, two at least, left on the field for Dupec in that game that could have split that game open wider. And um, But Forza did match them. You know, they Unfortunately, they turned the ball over three times themselves, and that kind of cost you uh, – and op that cost you opportunities in big games. But evenly wise, they played very great with Dupac in that game. And they just did not capitalize on a couple opportunities that they had. Now you got the Giant and Lena Winslow here. And you got to take control of everything that you have. You have to be able to stay disciplined. You have to be able to gain yards. You got to beat them off the line. And you're going to have to play faster. If they can do that, they will have a chance to keep this game within reason. But with that said, Lena Winslow is still the three-time defending state champs who have owned Forreston in every game played since week nine of 2021. A lot of people are saying that this game could potentially be a running clock. I don't think it's going to be a running clock. That's only happened once in this entire rivalry, which dates back to 2001. And that was in 2019 when Lena Winslow ran roughshod over Forreston in Forreston back in week seven of that season. I think Forreston will do enough to be able to manage the game clock, manage possession time to help drive this score down. What's going to need to happen for Lena Wenzel is they're going to have to take advantage of opportunities. Do I think they can score fast? I do. But Forreston, like Lena Winslow, is very good at staying home and playing disciplined defense, covering their gap responsibilities, and setting an edge. So where it's going to be won at is the typical cliche. It's going to be one up front. But at the same time, when you take a look at the two lines up front, it heavily favors Lena Winslow by a large margin. And if Lena Winslow can neutralize Forreston's line, it won't take long for Lena Winslow to just begin pounding the ball, carry after carry after carry. But that's also the same techniques that we've seen out of Forreston over the years, too. Now, one of the things that we have seen out of Forreston in their game against Fulton and again against GCMS 
is they're a little slow to get outside, which is going to hamper them against a very fast Lena Winslow defense. So they definitely need to find the ways to stay within the tackles and gain the yards, the tough yards, going through the tackles, running that belly, running that guard trap, doing the things that we've seen forced and have a lot of success on over the years. But regardless, Lena Winslow is my pick to win in this game. I think it will be a great environment. but. The large favorite is the Panthers, and that's my pick to win. Our NUICfootball.com state rankings are presented by Leading Edge Fundraising. If you need to raise funds for new uniforms, tournament expenses, equipment, or more, look no further. Brandon Sharp at Leading Edge makes it easy for you and your team to have a fun and competitive way to raise funds for your program. Give Brandon a call today at 563-514-1647. Leading Edge Fundraising, your premier fundraising company. Let's take a look at our NUICfootball.com state rankings brought to you by Leading Edge Fundraising. We're going to start in eight man where not much has really changed there. Number one is Amboy at eight known. Number two is Villageville at seven and one. Swapping spots out again are Polo coming at number three at seven and one. And St. Thomas Moore is at number four at eight known. Ridgewood comes at number five at six and two in Martinsville is number six at seven and one. Number seven is Milford Cisna Park at six and two. Number eight is South Fork at six and two. And number nine is Flanagan Cornell Woodland at six and two. And rounding out the top 10 is South Boyd at five and three. Other teams receiving votes are West Prairie at five and three and Pawnee at four and four. In class 1A, not a whole lot of change here either. Number one, Lena Winslow at 8 0. Number two, Altoff Catholic at 7 and 1. Coming in at number three or moving up to number three is Camp Point Central at 8 0. And at number four is Morrison at 7 and 1. Hope Academy is number five at 7 and 1. And coming in at number six are the Forest and Cardinals at 7 and 1. Number seven is Greenfield Northwestern at 8 0. And at number eight are the Fulton Steamers at 5 and 3. Number nine is Stark County at 8-0, and rounding out the top 10 is Aurora Christian at 6-2. Teams receiving votes are Newman Central Catholic at 6-2, and Anawan Weathersfield at 7-1, and Leroy at 7-1, and and Casey Westfield at 7-1. and In Class 2A, number one, Moreau Forsyth is 8-0, and at number two is Bloomington Central Catholic at 8-0. Number three is Seneca at 8-0, and Tri-Valley is number four at 8-0. Athens comes in at number five at 7-1, and, and Rockridge moves up to number six at 7-1. and one. Shelbyville is number seven at 8-0, and, and Modern Day is six and two at number eight. At number nine is Farmington at 7-1, and, and rounding out the top ten is Johnston City at 7-1. and one. Other teams receiving votes are Knoxville at 7-1, and one, Westville at seven and one, Bismarck Henning Rossville Allen at six and two, and Moments at seven and one. In class three A, number one, the Byron Tigers are eight no. Number two is Montini Catholic at five and three. Number three is Princeton at seven and one. Number four is Wilmington at seven and one. Coming at number five is Williamsville at six and two. The Dupec Rivermen come in at number six at seven and one. Roxana is number seven at eight and oh. Olympia is number eight at six and two. Ducoin is number nine at eight and oh. And rounding out the top ten is St. Joseph Ogden at six and two. Other teams receiving votes are Tolono Unity at six and two and Greenville at eight and oh. So that gives you a look at our NUICfootball.com state rankings as we enter week nine. Our NUICfootball.com Players of the Week is sponsored by our friends at Bench Warmers. Each winner receives an extra large pizza and a dozen boneless wings. Just stop in to claim your prize. Located in Freeport at 2143 West Galena Avenue, Bench Warmers is a great place to gather with friends to watch the big game. For American pub food and fun at its finest, Check out Benchwarmers and make sure you try the cheese curds. 
Our bench warmers player of the week in 11 man goes to Stockton's Michael Haas. Michael was on the offensive line that helped block the way for 249 yards rushing, and on the defensive side of the ball, he picked up 11 tackles along with two fumble recoveries as he helped guide Stockton to a 14-6 win over Dakota to help get them in a position to make the playoffs. Congratulations, Michael, on your Player of the Week honors. And in eight-man, our Player of the Week goes to Amboy's Quinn Leffelman. Quinn picked up 81 yards rushing and three touchdowns as Amboy put away Orangeville 72 to 12. And both teams will probably revisit this game in the first round of the playoffs if everything plays out as thought. Congratulations, Quinn, on your Player of the Week honors. All right, I said I'd touch base with the playoff outlook. So here's a couple things that I went through and did this week. I took a look at all the teams that were 5-3 and three, uh, within the playoff eligibility standards, and I found 220 teams that had a 5-3 and three record. One of those had to be a, C, a, a CPL adjustment, Chicago Public League adjustment, because they came out of, the, out of a division which is only only allowing two teams to make the playoffs. So that gave me 219 teams that were able to be five and three playoff eligible teams. That left me with 37 teams left to fill to get to that 256 team bracket. And with that, once I went through all of the teams that were four and four and projected out what I felt they would be at once the uh, games get played, I had every 5-4 and four team making the playoffs. Granted, I did make a mistake, so I had to make an adjustment. So as of now, the last 5-4 and four team to get in that I have on my list is Chicago Noble Golder at 5-4 and four with 20 playoff points. The next team up would be 4-5 and five Brother Rice, who has 48 playoff points. So there, there are ways still to see uh, a 4-5 and five team get in. But currently, I have no four and five teams in the playoffs, and all five and four teams making the playoffs, which means that our at large bid is right at that cut line right now. With that, there are a few games that we have seen that can definitely help uh, lend to cut lines changing. Um, and if you are on our Facebook or uh, Twitter page, I have put those games out there, but what we have for those matchups are uh, a few of these games here, more so in the small school arena, Class 1A through Class 4A. So games that I feel could be critical to that cut line for those four classes that change are as follows. Stockton versus Galena. A Galena win will keep Stockton out of the playoffs altogether. Rockford Lutheran versus Genoa Kingston. This game is a game where the winner will get into the playoffs regardless of what happens, but it will determine how the cut line looks simply because Rockford Lutheran with a win would be in the Class 1A playoffs where Genoa Kingston would be in the Class 3A playoffs. Argenta Oriana against Cumberland. Uh, if Argenta wins, that would put them into the Class 1A field, thus moving the cut line down for Class 1A if they can get in. Cumberland is already in to the Class 1A playoffs, but a potential shuffle there could potentially move them out and in the Class 2A as well. Clifton Central versus Salt Fork. Again, this is another game where we could potentially see Clifton Central win. And if they do, they could either make their way into the Class 1A playoffs as one of the larger teams, or they could shift that line and be in the Class 2A playoffs as well. Red Hill versus Carlisle is another game that we have that is going to determine uh, a potential cut line. Um, Red Hill would definitely be in Class 1A with a win, 
Carlisle, if they win, would knock Red Hill out, but they would get in, and then they would probably be one of the smallest Class 2A teams in the field with an enrollment of 300. Down in Class 2A, we have Chester at 4-4 four four playing Warrensburg-Latham. If Chester wins this game, they will be 5-4, and four, and with an enrollment of 330, they would be in the playoffs. Um, they are projected to win this game, so really it's going to affect the cut line if they are to lose. Piasaw Southwestern plays Hillsboro with a win. Southwestern is in at 5-4, and four, and they would be in the Class 2A field as one of the Bigger Class 2A schools, but if they lose, they're out. Hillsboro does not have a path into the playoffs, but that would drive the cut line up higher for 2A to pull in another team projected into 3A down into the 2A playoffs. Illini West versus Central A&M. Illini West comes in at 4-4. Four and four. Central A&M is 3-5, so Central A&M has no path in. Illini West has to win to get in. If they win, they will be in 2A, but again, if they lose, that's going to move that 2A cut line higher, drawing in a 3A team. Row, Chicago Row Clark versus Chicago Hansberry. Both teams are 4-4. Four and four. Noble Road Clark is a Class 2A team, or, yeah, Class 2A team, where Hansberry would be a 3A team. So whichever team wins here is going to change uh, the trajectory of that cut line. And right now, Hansberry is the favorite in that game. Monmouth Roseville versus Sherrard. Is another one I have picked out. Monmouth Roseville is four and four. Sherrard is three and five. Until last week, Sherrard uh, was doing a lot to make some noise with a potential opportunity of getting in the playoffs. However, that that run came up short. But I would not be surprised to see them give Monmouth Roseville some fits here. The Titans are the favorite in this game to get to five and four. If they do, they will be in Class Three A. If they lose, that's going to push that cut line a little higher for Class 3A, drawing in a potential 4A team back into the 3A field. Beardstown versus Calhoun. Uh, Calhoun is in the playoffs in Class 1A, but Beardstown's on the outside looking in for Class 3A. If they can get the win over Calhoun, that would put them into the playoffs uh, as one of the smaller Class 3A schools. Calhoun is the favorite in this game, however, so we'll see how that plays out. In Class 4A, you have Cahokia versus O'Fallon. Uh, Cahokia is a Class 4A school. O'Fallon is a Class 8A school. So there again, you won't really see it project much into 8A per se, but a win by O'Fallon is going to... Uh, keep another team out of the Class 4A playoffs, which will eventually play to that line moving. And then you have DePaul versus De La Salle, uh, Chicago DePaul versus Chicago De La Salle. De La Salle is out, but DePaul is 4-4 four and four with an opportunity to get in, um, taking a look at what both these teams have going for them. I would have to say that um, the favorite in this game is probably going to beat DePaul, but it looks like it could be a pretty close game. DePaul gets in, or with a win, DePaul would get into the 4A playoffs. And like I said, they, they are the favorite in this game, but it definitely... Looks like it could be a potential for a close game. So that gives you a look at what we see in the Class 1A through 8A playoffs um, as far as the outlook is concerned for the for smaller classes. Looking in the eight-man division, there are 
four teams outside of the top 16 with potential pass into the playoffs, and that is Christian Life, who is four and four. They have to win to get in. If they lose, even at four and five, they do not have enough playoff points to get in. So a win and Christian Life is in, but they are not the favorite in the game that they're playing. Blue Ridge is three and five. They have 43 playoff points. If Blue Ridge can win at four and five, they would knock Bushnell Prairie City out of the playoffs and take their spot. West Central is three and five. They play West Prairie, who is five and three. If West Central upsets West Prairie to get to four and five, they will push Bushnell Prairie City out because they beat Bushnell Prairie City a couple weeks ago. And Alden Hebron is three and five. If they were to win over Orangeville, they would flip spots with Orangeville to get into the playoff field. So there's the pass for eight man. Um, you, you basically, you have your 16 teams in, you have four more that can play for a potential opportunity to get in. The four that are on the outside looking in are not the favorites to get in at this time. Um, so it will be interesting to see how all of this uh, plays out in week nine here. Overall, that gives you a look of what we're looking at as we head into week nine. There are some critical games to keep tabs on that can kind of change the trajectory. Week nine tends to be that week where – all hell breaks loose and we got bells and whistles going everywhere, flashing lights, and all of a sudden we got teams making the playoffs that were never a thought to make the playoffs because all of a sudden they found their themselves at five and four and have made the cut. And we got other teams that are already there and now they're just playing for seeding position. Um, and, and, and it's just a lot of fun to take a look at and see what those things uh, are and how these games play out and how it's going to shift the brackets and change things around. Outside of that, uh, we will have our seventh annual playoff show live at 7 p.m. on Saturday. I will be joined by View from the West, Greg Armstrong, and uh, a spotlight on eight-man football's Joe Merdian, who also works with WLLT to broadcast games in the eight-man uh, league, and taking a we'll we'll take a look at class four A down to or class three A down to eight man, and we'll be able to break down uh, players to watch, teams to watch, who we think are going to be actual players within the playoffs. We'll go through and talk about projected matchups what our projected bracket looks like. And then we'll, once IHSA and IFA release those brackets, we will release them live as well. And then we'll, we'll swing back through and take a look at what our real matchups are and how we feel um, some of those key matchups will uh, break out. And then we'll pick our winners on who we think will be in the state championship games in Monmouth and Bloomington and who our pick to win is for each of those games. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, we go live at 7 p.m. Brackets begin to release at 8 p.m. So we'll have an hour of basically a pre-game, a preview show going through on things that we see happening. And then we'll let loose with the brackets and all potential matchups and how we see things breaking out. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's been a lot of fun the last couple of years when we've done it this way with a panel and looking forward to it once again. So get out to the games this week. Cheer on your teams. As always, root for the NUIC.